Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Miriam Green, Director of Marketing and Alumni Affairs at American Friends of the Hebrew University. Thank you for joining us today for our Alumni Association's Torch Talks event. There are many ways you can get involved with us um, from participating in future events, whether in person or virtual, sharing your alumni story and photos, sharing job openings to put on our alumni job board, organizing reunion, again, whether in person or virtual, and giving to the Alumni Annual Fund, which supports student scholarships at Hebrew University. And soon we'll be launching an alumni business directory online. So if you're interested in learning more about any or all of these opportunities, please email me at alumni at afhu.org. Our next alumni and friends event will be March 30th in Aventura, Florida with HUVP of Strategy and Diversity, Professor Muna Khoury. And our next Torch Talks virtual event is April 20th about Israeli music in the Orient. Again, if you're interested in participating or to learn more about any of the activities previously mentioned, please email me at alumni at afhu.org. We'll be taking questions in the middle and at the end of today's presentation. And as I mentioned, you are muted now, but to submit a question, please type it into the Q&A chat box and we'll do our best to get to as many as possible. You can also use the raise your hand feature. Um, and if you want to ask a question verbally, I'll unmute you. I'm now pleased to introduce our speaker today, Jenna Fisher. And for any Office fans out there, you don't need to be disappointed that it's not the actress from the show because she's <laughs> equally fantastic. A leadership expert and senior partner at Russell Reynolds Associates, one of the top recruiting firms globally, Jenna has been helping women navigate the upper echelons of American business for more than 20 years. And she's convinced that now is the time for real progress. Her book, To the Top, which hits bookstores this week, very exciting, challenges companies to close the gender gap in their executive and board ranks. With compelling case studies of women who succeeded in the C-suite, social science evidence, and her, own, uh, and her own experience from climbing the corporate ranks as a mother of two, To the Top provides both the inspiration and a playbook for how we can all create meaningful change in our world. By way of background, Jenna received her MBA at Wharton School of Business and attended Duke Law School. And she attended Rice University, where, in my opinion, I might be a little biased, she did her best work at her junior year abroad at the Hebrew University in 1994. Jenna grew up in the suburbs of Boston and is the mother of a 12-year-old daughter who is busy studying for her bat mitzvah, very exciting too, and a 16-year-old son. Jenna, thank you for being here with us today and during such a good week for you. So I know, oh. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, so I know that when we spoke earlier this week, I mentioned that there's a, re a recent Pew Research study that came out that the setting of the pay gap really has not changed much in the last two decades. And I also learned doing a little more digging that women lose on average $500,000 to the pay gap. Um, and this affects Black and Latina women even more because they can lose over 900,000 over their career. Um, and the, um, the research that I read said that the pay gap also fuels um, just even more because women, uh, if they don't earn as much, then it can affect their ability to accumulate well, to form savings, investments, and even home ownership. And women are also more likely uh, to take time off to care for children or for family members. So it leaves a lot to be desired, but it also leaves a lot of growth and uh, opportunity for change. So with that being said, what inspired you to write uh, the book to the top? Absolutely. First of all, Miriam, Jen Jeremy, thank you so much for having me here. It's great to see you and um, I'm honored to be uh, part of the Hebrew U Alumni Club. Um, so I've always had a passion for keeping women on a path to professional success. It started back when I was in college. I was a sociology major, and I wrote my honors thesis on the differential and performance between boys and girls in math and science. And what I learned at that time was that the only statistically significant discrepancy between boys and girls was around their levels of self-confidence, not around their achievement. And then fast forward a decade to when I started working here at Russell Reynolds, as an executive recruiter and leadership advisor. And I would hear all the time from women, I'm the only one, only one, only one. And I think, well, you're not the only one, but maybe you're the only one at your company. 
And so I started convening those groups of women board members and CFOs, the two groups of folks I recruit here together. And then simultaneously, I also had the experience countless times where I would be introduced to an incredible woman who had stellar academic credentials, had worked in a super hot company, had led an IPO, et cetera. But then she dropped out of the workforce after the birth of her second or third child. And then fast forward a decade, she wanted to get back in because she was bored. She wanted to be financially independent. She had gotten a divorce. Her kids had left for college, whatever the reason might be. And it was nearly impossible for her to reje rejoin the ranks of the working in a financially meaningful way. And it led me to think that there just had to be a better way of keeping women with a toe, if not an entire foot or more in the world of work, because I believe that until women are financially on par with men, there can really be no true equality. And right now at the rate we're going, it will take 132 years to get to economic parity between men and women, which I think is really a travesty when you consider that, of course, we're 51% of the population, that's always been the case. But now we are more than 50% of college graduates, uh, graduate school graduates, 71% of valedictorians. And um, so in, setting, in writing this book, I set out to interview dozens of incredible and diverse women all around the globe to learn their stories that were both inspirational and pragmatic so that others could benefit from them and companies could learn from them. That's great. And unfortunately, very so much needed. Um, so what, in your opinion, why is it important to have women like in the upper ranks at companies, whether it's corporate, nonprofit, academics? Yeah, well, I'm going to tell you kind of a funny, a funny, a little bit uh, edgy story, which is um, one of the stories I share in my book is about Sally Ride. When she was about to become the first American woman in space, we might all remember this. The NASA engineers, who were all men, came to her and they said, you know, Ms. Ride, we've been contemplating what would happen if you got your period in outer space for the six days you're going to be on the shuttle? Would 100 tampons be the right number for you to have? And of course, it's funny because she said, no, 100 is not the right number. But the question came from a very earnest and well-intentioned place. And for me, it highlights the fact that when the people who are making decisions are not representative of the people they are serving, there can really be a lack of understanding and unintended consequences. And for me personally, I feel like the expression see it to be it comes to mind here. And of course, men can and will absolutely be both mentors and sponsors. And we could talk about that a little bit later coming up through the ranks, but there's nothing quite like having representation at the top of companies for younger women to look up to so they can see themselves and reassure themselves that it's possible to stick it out even when it's really hard. So, I mean, those are a couple of reasons I think it's important to have more women running companies. Of course, there's been so much research that's proven that more diverse voices, both at the executive level and at the board level, yield better financial outcomes for companies. So that's kind of table stakes here. So to be clear, I'm not suggesting companies do this out of benevolency or kindness. They should do this out of their pure economic, carnivorous, capitalistic desires, because it will yield better financial results. That makes sense. Uh, so do you think, I guess, like, you know, over the last 20 years um, of your, your experience professionally, what the definition of what a successful leader looks like? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it used to be thought, as I'm sure we can all relate to, that the more traditional male, and I'm putting that sort of in air quotes, forms of leadership, being disruptive, being a risk taker, being heroic, being galvanizing, all of these things were kind of the hallmarks of a great leader, that and, and probably being, you know, six feet, three inches tall. Um, but what we've seen and what we've learned through our research here at Russell Reynolds, with we have a partnership with Hogan which is generally considered to be the preeminent executive assessment tool, is that actually it's not those leaders that are most successful. It's the leaders that can be both those things that I just mentioned, those more loud forms of leadership, but it's the leaders that also can do the sort of antithetical things to that thing. Pe people who can be more pragmatic, who can be more vulnerable, be more connecting, 
quieter forms, you know, I'm going to say softer, I'm putting that in quotes because I actually don't like that term soft, soft skills, but that's a term we often have used. Those are the leaders that actually win the day. And I think we saw this in droves with COVID, with a real need to lean in and to lead with connectedness and empathy and kindness. And we saw so many women really shine as leaders during COVID. And that was another reason that I chose to write my book when I did. Very nice. And I'm curious, when you were researching and speaking to um, a lot of women for your book, what did you, was there anything surprising uh, that you learned when speaking to these women? Yeah, there actually were quite a few surprises. As you might imagine, I had my own hypotheses. When I actually set out to write this book, I had the idea for it seven or eight years ago. And it was really predicated on uh, several times every year I uh, speak at top business schools like Harvard and Stanford and Wharton. And I've had so many women who have come up to me afterwards saying, is it really possible to have both a meaningful career and a uh, productive family life? And that question has never abated over the years. And so I it's like, gosh, like there has to be a way of assuring these women that this is possible. And so I actually set out to write my book kind of as a guide to younger women. Um, but then as I was conducting my research, what became crystal clear to me is that it's not the women who need to change. It's the companies that need to change and our societal structures that need to change because the way that the world of work has been built, it was built by men for men. And it's not to say that men did anything intentionally wrong. It was created at the beginning of the industrial era when women weren't really working so much outside the home. And it was predicated on a system where people, you know, started going, commuting from their homes to offices. They had to be watched to make sure they were doing the work. They were putting widgets together on an assembly line. We didn't have the technology or the tools to collaborate and communicate remotely. So it was obviously a very, very different world. And, um, and so as I was interviewing women, I realized, you know what, although I want there to be lots of takeaways for young women at the end of every one of my chapters, I have takeaways for younger women on their way up in terms of what they should be thinking about. But actually, I wrote it directed at companies and people in companies and management, because I think that is where we have the biggest ability to make change that will be meaningful. Um, and I had lots of surprises along the way, and I get into lots of them in my book, but I'll mention just one here, um, which is a couple of things I hadn't thought of. So for heterosexual couples, the woman on average is two and a half years younger than her husband. And so it stands to reason that when the couple is married for a few years, they have children, the couple looks at their income and there's a good chance at that point, the man is making more money in that moment because he could have twice the work experience that his wife has. However, that speaks nothing to potentiality. And I think we really need to think about careers in long range terms and support women as they're developing their careers before their careers get snuffed out too soon, which is one of the reasons that we really need to normalize extended paternity leave Parenting should be done by both genders. It's not enough for companies to have paternity leave options. We need to be creating the culture in our organizations where men don't feel friction about taking time at home with their families. Otherwise, what happens is there's a sort of bifurcated system where the indirect message is sent to women that home and hearth is really up to women to manage. And you know, last time I checked, it took two people to make the baby. So I think it really should be something that is, you know, contributing. And by the way, the U.S. is the only industrialized country in the world that doesn't have a federal family leave act. Um, so that is something I hadn't really thought about a whole lot, to be honest. I mean, I know when I had my children, I think my husband got exactly four hours off from work or something like that, you know, um, and he was kind of irrelevant. But I think, wow, what a loss for him, you know, like that is, you um, that's a shame and it doesn't have to be like that. I know it's changing, but it needs to change faster. And I'm curious, um, this is just something I, I thought of for countries that do have federally mandated um, paternity and maternity leave, do those companies in, in those countries like see more benefits versus in the US where that doesn't exist yet, do you know? Well, it, that's a complex issue um, because some of those, like we always sort of, hold out the Nordics as being quite progressive, and they are in many ways. 
and they do have higher percentages of women at upper echelons of government and business. However, there are also in those countries some different systemic challenges that they have. So for example, in most of the Scandinavian countries, which are otherwise quite progressive, they labor is so expensive that um, it's quite challenging. Like nannies don't really exist, maybe for the uber, uber rich. Um, so it's very hard to get childcare and, and outsource childcare in the form of daycare closes at four o'clock. So many parents of young children have to leave their work early in the day there to go get their children. They also have more of a culture of like, you do it yourself, um, which is challenging because, you know, I always say having it all doesn't mean doing it all. If you are a woman with a full-time job, you cannot also be expected to do everything that a stay-at-home parent would do on top of that. That's just simply unachievable. And women are awesome and superhuman in many ways, but they shouldn't truly have to be superhuman to be successful. So it's, it's a little bit of a murky topic because it's not just a one-for-one -one correlated um, matter, but there are things that would suggest, yes, when there's more equality, women do rise to higher ranks, but they're, you know, different places have different issues. Right. That makes sense. So I know you, you had said that, you know, you wrote the book more that for the fact that like companies needs to change women, you know, it's not directed necessarily at women. That being said, do you have you know, I guess what are, what are like, is there a specific or are there multiple like pitfalls that women can take during their careers that you could help us potentially try to avoid? Yeah, I think, you know, one thing is many people quite understandably, once they become parents, they say, okay, I'm going to crush my day job and I'm going to rush home and spend as much time with my children as possible and forget about everything else. And that makes a lot of sense, you know, in that you're optimizing for the two most important things potentially, but you play that forward over many years. And what happens if all of a sudden you find yourself in a job where you're underpaid or you're unhappy, or you feel stuck or your network has dried up, or you want to get in onto an outside board, you know, all these things could happen. And one of the women I interviewed in my book, Jennifer Goldfarb, who's the founder of Ipsy, which is an online beauty company, she talked to me about networking and how that was really impactful for her career. And that led me to develop um, this idea of the once a month rule, which is you sort of take yourself on a professional date once a month. It's not a big lift to spend, you know, three to four hours once a month doing some sort, and maybe it's not even that much time, maybe it's two hours, some sort of networking activity, whether that's meeting a mentor for lunch going to an industry event, participating in an alumni panel, something that broadens your network where you can learn from other people. Um, and I think, you know, it's it's actually good to interact with those people too, could be in person if, if possible. And for Jen, this really made a huge difference to her career because she got to a point where she was a banker and she really, she really had a passion for entrepreneurship, but she didn't really know how to get unstuck. And by leveraging her network, it really helped lead her to another job out of banking, which then led her to starting her own company, which has been, you know, it's now a billion dollar company. So I think networking sometimes gets sort of a dirty name, like it's cheesy or it's asking for favors, but you have to remember, it's not about standing around in a ballroom of a hotel, you know, exchanging business cards. This is about connecting people to one another and everybody has a skill that actually might be beneficial to other people. And you could be doing somebody a favor by getting to know them. So look at it from a more positive and productive perspective. Very good advice. Um, so we have a question from Ruth, uh, who's, who's with us today. So she said last week at the Know Your Value Conference in Dubai, Gloria Steinem said, there will be no equity at work until there's equity at home. Why does this continue to be a woman's is women's issue and men have not picked up their share of responsibilities at home? Yeah, it's a great question. I just did a session with my other alma mater, the Wharton School of Business uh, last week with Eve Radsky, who uh, is a friend of mine who wrote the book Fair Play. She just also did a documentary with uh, Jennifer Newsom, the wife of the governor of California on this very topic. And one of the things she said, which I loved is, you know, we talk about um, we have to teach girls to code, but really we need to teach boys to care. And this starts at a young age um, with, you know, when you think about all of the invisible work that happens in a home. And 
as I mentioned earlier, I actually think it starts before the child is born. There's no reason just because the woman is the person physically birthing the child that we know any more about taking care of children or home than a man does. Like this is all stuff that's learned and we, you know, shove baby dolls into little girls' arms and we shove trucks into little boys' arms. I know that's changing, but that's that's the stereotype and it exists for a reason. That has a a snowball effect over the course of time. And so I think a lot of equality, I mean, I tell you, I would not have the career and family life I have if my mother-in-law was not a huge feminist and raised my husband to do his own laundry and empty the dishwasher and get his own dinner. Um, and so I think we need to teach our boys to become independent. And it's not helping when you're taking care of your children. It's co-parenting, right? It's like, and so I think a lot of it is women have, been dealt this hand of cards where all of us, you know, for many years, for many millennia, women were taking care of everything on the home front and creating the connection and community. And the men were out, you know, hunting or doing whatever. And that, you know, became the system we have today of men have to go be the breadwinner and women have the choice, you know, of doing, but it's like, oh, but if you have the choice, but you still have to do everything on the home front. And that just needs to change. I mean, just women can't put up with that, right? I mean, so read the book, Fair Play that addresses that issue, I think beautifully. Um, there's also, like I said, the documentary, but um, I think it's also, you know, it's a confidence issue on some level for women too, because society has a lot of expectations of women that are unfair. Um, and, you know, I've had a lot of friends over the years at my law school class, there's only one woman who has children who's still working full-time in the law, which is pretty shocking, right? Out of, you know, hundred women in the class. Um, and I think it's because women feel like they can't do it all and they shouldn't have to do it all. Like I have a good friend who I used to work at Bain with, who's very successful CEO entrepreneur. And she was guilt ridden because she felt like, oh my gosh, I, I should be, you know, going to the farmer's market and, and picking out the organic vegetables and making the, the baby food from scratch for my, my son. And it's like, well, that, I mean, if that brings you joy, go, go for it, you know? Um, but if you're doing it because you feel like that's what you have to do to be a good mother, um, you might want to, you know, think about outsourcing a little bit. Um, so I think some of it's expectation setting and caring, and some of it is women need to say, you know what, like, I'm not a superhuman. Um, let's figure this out and then sit down with your partner and figure out who's doing what. And, and Fair Play has a really great checklist of invisible work that you should go through. Thank you. I think, and I honestly agree. I always, uh, I always scoff when people say like, oh yeah, Mike, my, my husband is, is babysitting the kids. I'm like, it's his children too. You don't babysit your old children. You're watching your old children. It's the, you get same, even play, playing field. Um, so Jeremy actually also, he just wrote in. So he said, he can't wait to read your book. Um, and he just finished Just Work by Kim Scott and her stories were shocking uh, to him. He's thinking as a man, what actions can he do proactively to be uh an upstander and an ally who helps make a difference at at you know his work and where and other organizations he's part of. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Jeremy. I love that question. And actually, you know, my book came out two days ago, and I've been really um, floored and and so happy to hear how many women or uh, men rather are reaching out to me to say what can I do both on the home front as well as at work because I think men really care deeply about this, and men also know that having more diversity at the top of organizations is a benefit for their family, it's a benefit for society, it's a benefit for companies. Um, and I'll tell you a story. Um, earlier in my career, my favorite color is pink. For those of you who can't see me, I'm wearing pink. I've got pink pens, I'm all about the pink. My book is pink. Um, a senior colleague of mine had pulled me aside and he told me I shouldn't wear so much pink if I wanted to get ahead. He came to my office, he's like, you know what, you might wanna tone down this pink thing. And it was sort of shocking and distressing to me because I was a top decile performer at the firm more than hitting my KPIs, doing great work. And he was focused on the color of my sweater. And I thought, well, that's like, it just, it struck a chord in me. And I was like, well, no, I'm not going to not wear pink. Like I'm going to be who I am. But if you talk to any woman who's tried to climb the ranks at work, one time or another, she'll be given advice on how she needs to act differently if she wants to make it to the top. Like, don't show too much emotion. Don't be too assertive. Don't talk about your family. Wear makeup, but not too much makeup. Be nice, but don't be too nice. Don't laugh too much. The list of rules has bordered on the absurd. 
Um, I just saw just re as recently as five years ago, one of the major four accounting firms required women to wear pantyhose like five years ago. It's like shocking. So I think we've got to get away from fixing women and start looking at the actions and attitudes of companies and their leadership teams. Because the reason that women constitute fewer than 10% of CEO spots is not because we're not leaning in enough or working hard enough. It's because we're trying to get the top of a corporate ladder that wasn't built for us to climb, especially in heels. So what can companies do? You know, one of the um, one of the things that one of the women I interviewed for my book, who's a total rock star, this woman, Sarah Mensa, who is the GM of the Nike brand at Nike. She, um, she does a thing that she calls leaving loud, which is whenever she leaves her office for anything to do with her family, she goes around and she tells everybody, hey, you know, I'm going to be going to the dentist appointment with my son or I've got the soccer game. You know, call me if you need me. I'm, I'm here for you. It's such a simple thing. It costs nothing. But it's something that normalizes the fact that most of us have a life outside of work, whether that's a family or, or something, you know, maybe it's taking care of aging parents, or maybe it's a hobby or interest. It doesn't just pertain to, to children. Um, although that is where we tend to see the biggest disconnect for women financially is once they have children, that's when they're, the earning disparity between men and women increases. But I think that if more men and women did that, it's such a small step to take but it really would allow people to be their authentic selves at work in some way. And I think that's a really important message because when people feel like they can't be who they are because they're not allowed to wear pink or whatever it is, all of a sudden they have to put on a mask at work and they have to feel like, oh, you know, I need to act more like a man or I need to do this or that. And it doesn't allow them to expend all of their energy on their job. And for a lot of us, our jobs take an inordinate amount of energy. I mean, the work that some of us do is almost magical. <laughs> and it's very hard to be magical if you're so concerned with appearances or what other people are gonna think of you or that people aren't going to like something you're doing. And I'm not saying don't take feedback. Of course, that's like a normal thing, but I think being aware of our own um, blind spots. And I mean, I'll tell you just a few, Months ago, I was getting on a plane and I was greeted at the door of the plane by a woman. I assumed she was a flight attendant. I sat down and then all of a sudden I saw her go in the cockpit. And then as we're taking off, I'm hearing her voice like she's flying the plane. And I was like, wow, I'm I'm pretty feminist or pretty progressive. And shame on me. My bias was that this woman was a flight attendant. And um, and you know, I'm thinking if I have that kind of bias, and it's a small thing, I suppose, but it really, it's a reminder, like we all have our own biases, right? Like that's just to be human. And we need to rethink those biases. Um, I think, you know, there are other things companies can do like we're creating return to work programs. I think we need to not be biased when it takes somebody perhaps a little bit longer to get to the top. So I talked earlier about how the successful career ladder rather, or arc has been really defined by men for men. It works really well if you're a man who doesn't have the burden of trying to get pregnant, stay pregnant, give birth, breastfeed, all of those physical indignities and challenges, not to mention, as somebody mentioned out the been mentioned earlier, sort of the imbalance in work that comes after that often, although I hope it's changing. Um, and so I think we need to perhaps give people a little bit longer to reach certain milestone promotion marks. You know, I have a woman on my team who's awesome. And she probably is working. I mean, she's still working full time, but she probably has like 85% the load of, of other people on the team because she's got two kids under the age of three. She's got a husband who travels. And you know what? I'd rather have 85% of an awesome employee than 0%. And if I were to hold her to, you know, this super high standard that she has to make partner in X amount of years, she would probably drop out or she'd find another job that was more accommodating. And I see as an executive recruiter, it is a war for talent out there. And the best companies are going to be the ones that realize, hey, you know what? Let's take 80% of an awesome person and let her walk for a period of time and just let her decide when she wants to run again. And I think we need to do that for women and men. There are lots of men who have had, you know, who've missed out, you know, who have not been able to do those kinds of things with their families. And I think this should be liberating for men and women. We're all living longer. I interview a bunch of women in my book who are hitting their stride in their 60s and 70s. Some of them, I mean, think about Nancy Pelosi, politics aside, you know, she didn't work outside the home until she was 43 and she became one of the most powerful women on the planet. 
in her 70s and 80s, right? So I think that um, we need to really rethink what, what good looks like. Does that answer your question, Jeremy? Yes, I think so. We get, we get, I got a nodding head. Um, we had someone else just ask a question. Um, what's the latest statistics on the salary gap in the US in, in knowing that some countries like Iceland make it impossible uh, to pay a different salary for the same role? Do you think that's possible in the US? Yeah, I mean, that, that data is multifaceted as well because it really depends on the industry, the role. I can tell you a few years ago, I was, um, I was conducting a search for a Fortune 100 company in the Midwest, and at the end of every search, we always pull together compensation benchmarks for the client. And so my research had pulled 15 companies that were similar revenue, market cap, location, industry, and looking at the different um, averages and, and deciles and so forth, quartiles. And I looked at the data and I was like, this must be wrong because there were, of the 15 people on the list, there were about seven women, eight men or nine men. It was like 15 or 16 people. And there was a 30% differential in both cash and overall compensation between the women and the men. And I thought, this, this can't be right. This is, well, I must, I'm like, there must be another reason. And so my researcher, I had her, you know, look at it five ways, you know, till Sunday around, um, is it because the, the, the PE ratio of the company, is it that the women had fewer years of experience? Is it because the women came up through accounting and the men came up through banking? Is it because the woman was an internal promote? Is it, you know, we looked at probably literally two dozen different possibilities. There was nothing we could find that was statistically correlated other than the fact there are women and men. And I was so shocked and dismayed. Um, whenever I see that, and I think some of the, the states that have enacted laws to protect against this, like Massachusetts, New York, California, uh, where you have to disclose the compensation levels and you cannot ask the person their current compensation, um, I think there have been improvements because what I always tell companies if they're trying to, I don't think people are intentionally trying to lowball women specifically. It's just that often women are already coming from a lower basis because there, there has been some systemic sexism. Um, and um, what I tell them is you don't want compensation to be an issue for your worker. You want them to do their job and not even think about what they're making. You want them to come and not be distracted by getting a call from a recruiter when they learn that, oh my gosh, I'm 20% under market in terms of my compensation. So I do think all of these things are helpful, whether or not the U.S. would legislate it. I think, I mean, who knows? Um, I think that might be a heavy lift, <clears throat> um, but never say never. <laughs> Fair. So what advice would you give to people here? And, and I think beyond whether the fact that, um, that's not that we need a female president. Indeed we do. <laughs> um, advice that you would give to how, you know, whether it's our own daughters, it's ourselves, grandchildren, um, friends, nieces, you know, any, any woman at any stage of life, like what advice can we give um, with, I want to say future generations, but let's say even current generations. Um, I don't want to limit it to, to those under, you know, under 15. Um, you know, what advice could you give uh, that could help like, if we want to help inspire and encourage um, women? And I think also kind of to an earlier point you said, and to, to boys too, because it's not just about women. I think it's also about kind of changing some of these um, societal norms that we would yeah. expect like boys and girls to have. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, look, just as gendered roles have harmed women, to a lesser extent, I would argue they've harmed men. There are probably lots of men out there that would, if they could be free to do whatever they want, would love to be a kindergarten teacher. You know, that's not always maybe as socially acceptable as being something else might be, right? Yeah. So um, I think the first thing is we need to expose our children to lots of different things so that they can find their passion in life. I think that's critical. There are gonna be, especially for women who want to have children, um, because it, it is hard to, to do both. There are going to be a lot of distractions along the way. So you need to love what you do so that there's no question about your continuing to do it. 
Um, so I think that's one. I think another is we need to educate our boys and girls about financial planning from a younger age. I don't understand why we don't talk about it more in school. I remember when I was in high school, I took this personality test about what do you want to be when you grow up? And it was sort of t- said, okay, here's what you should do. And it, it, it told me at the end, I should be a clergy member or um, a social worker. And I remember thinking, that's great. Those would be really rewarding careers, but I don't want to, you know, be reliant on a spouse or anybody else. Like I want to make sure I have enough money for my children. And um, so I'm not saying to not pursue those paths, but I do think that you need to find something you can make a good living doing. And I was lucky enough to be raised by parents who drilled financial independence into my head from the earliest age I can remember, never be reliant on anybody else. And um, because you never know what might befall you in life. And um, so you need to prepare for that. So I do think that's something that's very important. Um, And then as you get older in your career, you need to choose an organization that has a history and a track record of supporting and promoting women. I know for me personally, the reason I joined Russell Reynolds specifically in our San Francisco office is that when I interviewed here 20 years ago, almost all of the partners were women who had working partners and they had children. And I remember thinking, this is great that you can kind of see it to be it. And I, not that I couldn't have been successful working with all men or whatever, that would have been fine. But I think I had the sense, even though I didn't have children yet, that like, hey, at some point, it might be really nice to know that the people who are senior to you you can look up to them and they can sort of empathize with what you might be going through. And, and that has turned out to be really great for me. Um, and then finally, I would say you need to look for both sponsors and mentors. And there's a lot of talk about mentors. Mentors are people who you admire, who you look up to, who you sort of see yourself as and want to emulate more. And that's great. Mentorship is wonderful and everybody should have a mentor or mentors. However, I think the more important perhaps or more salient Thing that more women need are sponsors. And sponsors are people who create opportunities for you in your career. They're the people who go around and talk you up around the company uh, to other people. They're people of influence um, that you can learn from. And I mean, I'll tell you in my own career, I had a sponsor earlier on. He definitely was not a mentor. He was not somebody I, I hate to say, but like, I don't think I really even liked him that much. Like, honestly, like he wasn't somebody I aspired to be other than he did excellent work. He was excellent with clients. And I really admire that about him. He was a rainmaker. He was very successful and influential. And I worked my butt off for him and I made him look good. And he in turn made me look good and gave me lots of great opportunities. And I think sometimes women think they need to find a sponsor or a mentor that's a woman. And that is definitely not the case. I mean, Going back to 90% of CEOs are men, not to say your sponsor has to be a CEO, but there are lots of men who you need to have and and who want to be singing your praises. And I, going to Jeremy's question, you know, I have found nearly every man has a mother (laughs) as a starting point or daughter or sister or wife or colleagues who are women, and they want to help more women get to the top too. And so I think companies can um, put more formalized sponsorship programs into place. And that's also a good way to help advocate for women. That's great. Um, and we got it. We got a shout out for Jeremy for participating because, you know, we don't see a lot of men at these things though. Again, while this is geared towards how to reduce the gender gap, it's again, not just for women. So it's something, um, you know, I think that that everyone should be able to, to listen and get learnings from. One of the things that we talked about when we first spoke, um, and, and you mentioned it a couple of times here is just because, a woman's working doesn't mean you like shouldn't be expected to do the same amount of work at home that you can have it all doesn't mean you have to do it all so what is that what does that mean to you because clearly even when you said you spoke to the the class of business uh, students at Wharton that like that was still a question and I think that is still something that um, women feel whether they're students or early on in their career that you know they want to have a family, but how do you create this balance? And I think it's important to know that you don't have to do it all yourself. Yeah. Well, the thing that gives me a lot of optimism, Miriam, and the reason I wrote my book when I did is that I believe that right now women have a once in a generational opportunity to help achieve gender parity. Back in September of 2000, this was somewhat in the 
I guess, relatively nascent days of COVID, although I don't know if we knew it back then, I conducted a survey of about 200 of my clients and I asked them when it's safe to do so, how many days a week do you ideally want to go back into an office? And although most people, it was about 50-50 of men and women who responded to my survey, um, most people said two days a week felt about right to them. The really interesting finding in my mind was that at the barbells, the ends of the spectrum, it was only men who said they want to go back into the office five days a week. And conversely, only women who said they never wanted to go back in with any regularity save for special events. And although I think the pandemic at first had clearly a detrimental impact on women's careers, as so many parents had to help manage their children's online school and domestic helpers couldn't come to do their jobs as normal, I think as time went on, once kids were back in school, this new normal that we have of remote or hybrid working actually has become a huge benefit for families. And I would argue women in particular, many of the knowledge workers of the world have proven that we can do our jobs just as well, if not better remotely than by commuting into an office. And I I always sort of think about my grandmother because I remember when I was very young, she got her first washer dryer. It was like a big deal. And she like, it took up like this big spot in her kitchen. And she used, she lived kind of in, in the country. And so she used to scrub her laundry by hand and hang it out on a line to dry. And once she got her washer dryer, she never scrubbed her laundry by hand anymore. And similarly, we should all be leveraging technology to empower our workers. And I go back to what I said earlier, the system we have of driving to offices and managers needing to physically see their teams to ensure work was being done is modeled after, and it's a vestige of the industrial era from a hundred years ago. And we need to change our mindset around the trust we imbue in our workers and measure the outputs and not the inputs. There are lots of opportunities and times when it is great to look in the whites of somebody's eyes and, and to collaborate and work together shoulder to shoulder. That's great and that should be done, but it doesn't need to be done all day long, every day. And it used to be that if we had a, you know, somebody coming in the office at seven in the morning and leaving at midnight, we'd be like, ah, oh, that Bob, he's crushing it. He's a killer. Who knows whether Bob was doing anything other than surfing his internet all day long in his office. We have no way of knowing, but now we do. And of course there are new skills to be learned and muscles to be flexed and learning how to effectively manage remote working. But what an amazing opportunity we've all been given, not to mention from a DEI perspective, there's an egalitarianism in the Zoom world. Everybody's box is the same size. Doesn't matter if you're tall or short. Doesn't matter if you're in a wheelchair or not. Doesn't matter what your race is, what your color is, your sexual orientation, or your gender. Everybody gets a chance to speak up. It's very easy for a leader to look around and say, oh, you know, I haven't heard from so-and-so. Do you have a point of view? And so I think that we are at a moment now that we need to capitalize on because I do believe that if we utilize this moment well, it will it will yield lasting change. And so, and do you think that you know the the pandemic, which has you know led to everything you just discussed, like that has kind of led to this time to being like ripe for the picking to do to have this change in in, in the gender disparity and in, in pay. Sorry, say that again, Miriam. I'm not sure I understand. So, so you know, you were just talking about how you know COVID you know, despite all of the, the negative effects of it has lent itself to this opportunity of like remote working. So do you think that in part has led to now being like right for the picking to, to try and really focus on, on trying to end the this pay gap between men and women? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that it's not only that, I mean, there are a couple of forces at play here. We're seeing that things like the, the trait that we've historically perhaps associated with women, there no, there's nothing genetic in women that make us more compassionate or empathetic than, than men. These are traits that men can equally learn, of course, but um, there's a demand for those. We actually looked at about 20,000 of our position specifications over the last 20 years, and we've seen a huge uptick in those kinds of skill sets and disposition and personality traits being in demand. For, for searches that we conduct. So one is the demand, right? And you think about classic rules and laws of economics, if there's more demand and the supply is really changing, right? Like compensation goes up. Um, 
So I think that's one. And I think there's more tra pay transparency that is happening. Um, and I think we've also seen a huge shift in the balance of power between employees and employers over the last three years. Social justice has had a part to play in this. COVID obviously had a huge role. And at the same time, lots of baby boomers have retired. So that's created more of a gap in the demand for workers. The supply has gone down. So all of these forces, in my mind, are pointing to the fact that the time is now, women are in demand, we need to know our worth, and if we aren't getting paid what we are deserving of, we can walk. There are lots of other opportunities out there and companies that will want to have us. So, you know, try to make the company you're at, if you like it, you know, um, sort of cognizant of these factors, but if they're not hearing it, then I'm sure you can find employment elsewhere. Fair. Um, so I know we're we're getting close to to nearing the end. So I do want to um, encourage anyone. I want to open the floor if you have any questions that you haven't had a chance to ask yet. Um, feel free again to use the raise your hand feature or put it in the Q and A chat box. Um, so while I'm giving everyone a moment for that, um, you know, over your career thus far, what is let's say like one piece of advice, uh, career advice that you think it would you would, you could share with us that that really is maybe impact on you? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you kind of a personal story. Um, I guess first of all, I'd say no one grows up when they're twenty years old thinking they're going to become a recruiter. Um, I'd gone to college first thinking I wanted to go into academia, and then I realized you have to kind of be willing to move anywhere to be a professor. And I for sure knew I wanted to live in California, so instead I went to law school. Um, and then at the end of law school, I got recruited to go work at Bain as a management consultant. And then I you know, fast forward a few years, I decided I wanted to get my MBA. And I remember when I was in the, the process of getting, you know, about to apply for, for business school, one of the partners I worked very closely with at Bain, he said to me, okay, you know, what's your shtick? What's your angle? What, what are we going to say about you? And what do you, you know, what do you want to do after, after business school? And I was like, oh, I don't know, you know, maybe, maybe I'll just come back to Bain and become a partner. And he looked at me kind of quizzically and he said, you know, I don't see that happening. And I remember in that moment, I was like, what, what are you, what are you saying to me? You know, like, I remember like almost like my eyes like filled up with water. I was like, oh, you know, what is he saying that I'm not good at my job? And he was like, you know what, this job, you're, there are three things that are important here. There's the client piece, the team piece, and the, the value add, which is the quant piece. And remember, I was a sociology major, went to law school. So Excel was not like my love language. Um, he's like, you are incredible with clients. Like you're better than most partners here. You're awesome with the team. People love working with you, but you're just average at the quant piece. And that's the most important part here. And I knew he was right. You know, it, I was sort of like shocked that he said it so bluntly. He was British. So he said it with a beautiful accent so he could get away with it. Um, but he went on to suggest search to me, actually. He was like, you know, why don't you do something where your client and team skills and people skills are more central versus this, you know, number of stuff that you can do, but it's not your passion. And I didn't really know what search was, but I spent probably a year while I was still at Bain just talking to people who did it. And I ultimately kind of fell in love with, with the industry. And I remember being back home um, with my extended family over Thanksgiving in Boston and um, my aunt, I call, I jokingly refer to her as Aunt Ohio because she's very like middle of the road. Like I feel like the pollsters don't need to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to guess who's going to be our next president. She could just tell you. Um, and I remember her saying to me, oh my God, you went to all these prestigious schools and have all these like fancy degrees and you're going to be a headhunter. And I remember being like really joyful about it, thinking like, yeah. And I'm so happy that I even found out about it. And I think that the, the message to me is if everybody can find the thing that you're naturally really good at, that maybe you're naturally top decile at, and then you work really, really hard, you can become the best in the world at it. And I think it's such a good reminder that finding your passion to our earlier topic is so important. Um, because, you know, that's how you can really differentiate yourself. So I, I think it takes some courage. Um, it could be scary. I mean, certainly saying you're an executive recruiter is not as prestigious as saying you're a partner at Bain or a partner at a big law firm. 
but like, I'm so happy. <laughs> and, um, and so I feel really grateful that I was given that advice relatively early on in my career. So I could course correct and find something that was a fit. That's great. Um, so I think really the, one of the last questions I have, um, if we have time, we can try and do another one or two, but your book is out this week. So like, where, where can we find it? Oh, you can go to Amazon or any any bookseller. Any, I'll put the Amazon link in the chat here. But it came out two days ago, and um, hopefully it's selling lots because um, I'm hoping to make the bestseller list. Um, so that's the link to it. Um, but you can also get it at an independent bookstore, Target, Walmart, Barnes and Noble. It's for sale pretty much everywhere. So thank you for for reading it. That's great. I'm going to see if you have anything else. Oh, someone just said they just bought it on Amazon. Look at that. Um, so I think that, yeah. um, I mean, do you have any any parting words before I wrap up for everyone? Well, just, well, I would just say, you know, the one final thought I have is that one of the, the lessons I learned in interviewing the 50 amazing and diverse women I interviewed around the globe for my book is that these women made it to the top by being themselves. It wasn't by putting on a mask. It wasn't by being somebody different from who they are. And women have all the skills that we need to be successful. We need to change organizations so that we truly can be. Let's think of careers like webs, not ladders to be assiduously climbed day in, day out. Um, you know, it, we've got to give a little bit of grace for people to run the race at their own pace. And I think if we do that, we will absolutely not just recruit women, but we'll retain them for the long haul. That's great. Well, thank you so much. I think it's very inspiring for, for men and for women and hopefully companies uh, take lots of highlighters to your books and, and actually uh, make some changes that uh, you lay out for them. So thank you again for, for being here. Really very motivating and inspirational. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, if you have any questions you didn't get a chance to ask, you can always email me about that. Or again, anything I mentioned at the beginning, uh, upcoming events, you wanna get involved some way, whether you're an alum or not, we're happy to have you. Again, you can reach me at alumni at afhu.org. Um, we'll be sharing this recording later. So 